I am about to say the wokest thing to have ever left my lips. It's so left of center that even I am uncomfortable with it. But it's the God's honest truth and I just have to say it. I'm author Gwen Elise Clayton. And a couple months ago, my husband bought me a book titled A Tour of the Underground Railroad Along the Ohio River. We just moved to Ashland, Kentucky a few months ago, and he knows I like to read, he knows I'm into history, and, um, and I wanted to get to know the local history. So I started reading this book since February is Black History Month. I figured it was appropriate to do so. The book doesn't talk about Ashland specifically, but the general area played a key role in the Underground Railroad. You see, Kentucky is bordered on three sides by three rivers, and the part of Kentucky where I am, right across the Ohio River, which is what this book is about, is Ohio, the actual state of Ohio. Now, Ohio was a free state, and Kentucky was a slave state. The Underground Railroad was developing. Slaves would leave from our neck of the woods and cross the river into Ohio. The Underground Railroad was not an actual rail line with boxcars and train tracks and all that good stuff. Instead, it was a network of secret routes and safe houses established in the United States in the mid 19th century to help enslaved African Americans escape into free states and Canada. The Slave Trade Act of 1807 banned the importation of slaves into the United States, but it still allowed for slave owners who already had slaves here to breed them like horses or livestock. It was and that's where Kentucky comes in. The Industrial Revolution and the invention of the cotton gin helped increase the demand for cotton. And cotton is a very labor-intensive crop. Now, we didn't grow cotton here in Kentucky, but we did have the slave auction. So people would raise slaves and sell them as labor, laborers to the cotton states. I want to read from page 18 of this book. It explains it really well. So Kentucky was not a cotton state, nor did it support a large sugarcane industry. That was the other labor-intensive industry, was sugar. But what it could supply was the labor force needed in the South, as well as the production of crops like corn, tobacco, and hemp, which was used to produce cotton bale and bags, and commodities like pork, whiskey, and wine. As the demand for field hands grew, states like Kentucky provided the necessary labor. Slave auction sites became common and slave traders began to buy and hold slaves to ship them in large groups to auction houses in Natchez and New Orleans. Across the river in the free territory of Ohio, the city of Cincinnati started to spring up as a major population center. And with that, the Underground Railroad grew even more and people in the free area could see exactly what was happening in the slave states. The author Nancy Stearns Thice goes on to goes on to say the Ohio River was the defining place where visibility of trafficking eclipsed any notion of slavery as acceptable. As enslaved people began racing toward free soil, people in the north were no longer sanitized from the brutal realities of family separation, torture, and death that resulted from slavery. Slavery was transparent. So this really was the beginning of the end of slavery being seen as anywhere romanticized as anywhere near acceptable. This is the first time I've lived in a southern state. I was born and raised in Nevada and our motto is battle born because we were actually, we became a state October 31st, 1864, because President Abraham Lincoln needed the electoral votes in order to win re-election, and the Union Army needed the silver from our mines 
in order to make ammunition. So my the history that I learned growing up didn't really focus a lot on slavery and um, and the Underground Railroad. It's like I I knew what it was. I had heard of it. I had heard names like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and then later on there was Mary McLeod Bethune. And I in in sixth grade I did a book report on George Washington Carver. So I, those names I remember, but I don't remember the details. It was a long time ago and yeah, it's history class. So I didn't, I didn't have the respect for history that I have today. So I'm in a whole new place and I'm learning about the local history because you know me, I'm all about being local. And um, the one thing that has been missing that I've always wondered about throughout history, it's like we always hear, whenever we hear about slavery, we hear about the Southern states and the Confederacy and all that. We never hear about the freed blacks in the Northern states and in Canada. It's like, what, what happened to them? What were their lives like? It's like, I really like to watch the YouTube channel Townsend's and they're all about the 18th century and they do a lot of cooking and they're they're based up in Indiana and not far from where we used to live in Fort Wayne so I actually got to meet John Townsend and we're really into historical reenactments we love that kind of stuff and Townsend's does a lot of 18th century cooking and historical reenactments and stuff like that the only thing they ever talk about with African Americans is slavery the enslaved community so uh, he never talks about what happens what what was life like in the 18th century for freed blacks but this book covers it cincinnati grew into a thriving metropolis during the 19th century with the completion of the erie ohio canal in 1845 and the expansion of railroad construction cincinnati could expand trade and business using the ohio river and reach into the great lakes Cincinnati became a supplier of many products, of which the chief export became pork, earning it the nickname Porkopolis. The city also became the largest manufacturer of steamboats, attracting all of the associated subsidiary businesses. These opportunities attracted German and Irish immigrants in large numbers, and by the end of the Civil War, Germans composed 30% of, of the population. Black communities had settled into the Queen City and had become an early native population, but were threatened and subjected to racist bias due to the proximity of the slave trade across the river in Covington. Blacks, for the most part, had little prospects for upward mobility in the workforce because of the lack of educational opportunities. As Irish immigrants moved into the region, they competed with blacks for labor-intensive and low-paying jobs, adding to another layer of prejudice and competition for black workers. The mix of free blacks on the north shore of the Ohio River and enslaved blacks on the south shore threatened slaveholders who were increasingly edgy and fearful of losing their property. Stories of resistance and slave uprisings, such as John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and Nat Turner's rebellion, along with narratives of successful slave escapes and abolitionist newspapers, gave encouragement and hope for other freedom seekers to cross the borderland. Black laws were created in, the, in these borderland free states to discourage black settlements and deny blacks equal rights. These laws were passed in part to reduce the influence of free blacks because of the potential they had to harbor and help fugitive slaves. Slave laborers provided the menial labor needed for iron foundries, hemp, corn, and tobacco production. Manual construction, slaughterhouse work, and movement of goods and cargo on ships. Slave laborers worked on both sides of the river under permission and control of the slaveholders. Free blacks, new immigrants, and enslaved workers worked side by side. The mix of workers created a strange context of racial bias on many different levels as people were defining the American dream. That story 
took place in the city of Covington in northern Kentucky. And in that city, there is a mural today that um, depicts the story of a woman named Margaret Garner, who was a slave who crossed the icy Ohio River during winter to try to get her and her family, including her infant child, to the other side of the river in Cincinnati. And her story, her plight, her flight of freedom was the inspiration for this book, Beloved, which is another book that I've been reading this month. So um, this book, Beloved by Toni Morrison, won a Pulitzer Prize. And on my bucket list is to read every Pulitzer Prize winner for fiction. And since this is one of them, I went ahead and bought it at our local bookstore and I started reading it. Now I'm not done with it yet. And I will say that the writing is, it has a lot of jump cut. So it's, it's kind of jarring in some parts. And there's a lot of jargon that doesn't really work with 21st century language. But the, um, all of that aside, it is a beautifully written book. And it's, it's got a paranormal twist to it too. It's beautifully written for the most part. You just gotta watch for the jargon and the jump cuts because some she goes back and forth between memories and current day and conversations between different people that sometimes it's kind of hard to follow but it's really not that bad now the other book i'm reading this month and i just started it so i'm not very far along but of course had to read had to buy at least the 1619 project a new origin story of course this book came out in 2021 and it is based on the august 2019 article in the new york times magazine all about how the author nicole hannah jones she argues that the start of american culture like i not really it's government so much, but the start of American culture and American mindset started when the White Lion slave ship entered Jamestown Harbor. And that's when the first slaves arrived from Africa. And I think there might've been some from the Americas too, I'm not sure. So that's what this book is about. And she goes on to talk about how those, th that, that moment when the slave trade came to the United States, or I guess we weren't the United States, wait, were we, we were not the United States yet. So the Mayflower arrived in 1620 and the first slave ship came a year before the Pilgrims did. And Nicole Hannah Jones claims that that moment, that defining moment of the first slave ship set in motion our current way of defining democracy, race, um, capitalism, politics, citizenship, self-defense, punishment, inheritance, medicine, healthcare, justice, and some other, some other issues. So I'm looking forward to reading this, but before I bought this book, I, watched the master class on Amazon Prime Video. It was called Black History, Black Freedom, and Black Love. I didn't find anything offensive, so to speak. Um, of course, obviously I'm a white girl, but I have a really thick skin. And so things that might upset somebody else um, doesn't really bother me because history, history is what it is. And it, the legacy of what happened in the past is what it is. And it's not here to make you comfortable. It's not here to be pretty. It's just, it's a fact and we need to do better. So Nicole Hannah Jones has become really controversial for this 1619 project. You may have heard of it. Um, it goes, it's often mentioned alongside critical race theory, which is not mentioned in the book. And 
I only heard it mentioned once in the um, in the masterclass series, and it wasn't by Nicole Hannah Jones. It was some other woman. I forgot her name, but it does it does posit that the form of capitalism as we know it in the United States can be traced back to slavery, which was brought to the United States on that fateful day in August 1619. But first and foremost, I am an American. I love freedom and justice and little d democracy. Liberty and justice for all. You know, that kind of stuff. I'm all about it. So I'm all about Black History Month, which is in February every year. No other population group captures the story of the uh, the American quest for for liberty than the African diaspora. African Americans built this country. Their their bodies were used as capital to mortgage the building of this country, and yet for 400 years, they weren't allowed to participate in freedom. So one of the quotes that Nicole Hannah Jones said in her masterclass series was, the highest calling of patriotism is not to say that our country can do no wrong, but that it actually is critiquing our country to force it to live up to its highest ideal. It is the belief that your country can be the things that it says it can be and that our duty is to fight to make that true. I agree with that statement. I, and uh, that leads me to another quote of hers that, uh, that really forced the paradigm shift in me. We in the United States are the most unequal of the Western democracies. We have the highest rates of poverty. We have the stingiest social safety net. We have some of the weakest labor protections for our workers. That can be traced to those, that can be traced not to the textile mills in Boston, but to the plantations of the South. And she's not wrong. Throughout the master class, Hannah Jones compares the United States to other Western democracies. And I get that we are not as generous as other industrialized nations. Our social safety net is more of a patchwork strung together with flimsy threads that were strewn together based on political uh, pet projects that people thought that they wanted to have for one reason or another, for one of their pet groups. And instead of looking at it as a whole, saying, okay, what do we need to have a functional society? And that's, that isn't what we have today. We do not have a functional society. There's too many holes in that safety net. One thing that I didn't hear her say, and I haven't read that part of the book yet, so maybe she does address this later on, but I am greatly concerned in the executive to worker wage gap that is going on right now. And I can see that mindset. I could see her arguing. I don't know if she does, but I could see where she could easily argue that the CEOs and the hedge fund managers and the private equity firm managers, they have these huge, huge salaries and these huge incomes. And yet the workers are still making seven twenty-five an hour as a minim the federal minimum wage. The Economic Policy Institute reported in 2021 that from 1978 to 2020, CEO pay based on realized compensation grew by 1,322%, far outstripping S&P stock market growth, 817%, and top 0.1% earnings growth, which is 341% between 1978 and 2019, the latest data available. In contrast, compensation of the typical worker grew by just 18% from 1978 to 2020. So I don't know what kind of regulation or public policy we could implement to balance that out, but I think that needs to be a top issue that 
people need to address. We need to do something about this because that is not right. It just, it's just wrong. And if you don't see it as wrong, then something is sociopathically wrong with you. That problem needs to be addressed before we can have an honest discussion about labor, inflation, budgets, and safety nets in general. Getting back to the comments about Western democracies and industrialized nations, this is where I have my problem. We as citizens of these industrialized nations have succumbed to the rabid passive consumerism that was the problem, which was one of the problems that we've inherited from the slave trade. As I talk about in my book, From Out of Sellers, even though this is paranormal fiction, I still get a little political with the main character, Manuel Chavez, who is an adult now, but he grew up as the son of a migrant farm worker working in the vineyards at Fermata Cellars every year. So as he's, um, he's having this memory and he's, he's having a flashback of when he was a kid and how he's grown up and how he sees life now that he's 26 years old and he's back working at the winery as the marketing director. He's no longer in the field as one of the workers. So he's reflecting back on his life in Chiapas, Mexico. Ah, Mexico, my homeland. I hate it. Sure, the climate is perfect for agriculture, and but the good old boys that run things have fucked up the water supply, doused the land with chemicals, and treated the workers like slaves. Americans and their ever precious passive consumerism don't care who sacrificed what so long as they can buy everything for under a buck without having to face the poor souls who suffered such inhumane conditions in order to bring a bunch of swill to the land of the free. So that's kind of my opinion on passive consumerism and rabid consumerism. It's like we're in our hurry to buy shit. We buy crap, stuff that was made in China. So we're, we're consuming resources to make this crap and then um, we're using slave labor to produce the crap, and then we get it, and it just ends up spending eternity in the bottom of a landfill. It's like, who wants that? That's, that's not a good thing, and, and we shouldn't be doing that. We need to be active consumers. We need to buy our food from local food producers, not from Mexico or Chile, or Brazil, if we can help it. Um, try to buy Florida oranges. Try to buy California avocados. Just try not to, just be mindful of where your food comes from, where your clothes came from. Before this, um, before I started doing this video, I went to check to see my new sweater that I love so much that I got. I checked to see where it was made. It was made in China. So this is just, China is, is a horrible human rights abuser. They have very lax environmental laws. We have this huge trade deficit with a country that has lax labor laws and poor environmental regulations. And yet they have so much influence in our Western democracy and our industrialized nation that we are so proud of. So we need to, we need to correct that. So I'm not for globalism. Um, I'm all for individuals being respected. You get to do, I mean, you as an individual, as long as you're not hurting anybody, do whatever you want to do. And each country needs to do what's best for their country. Each state needs to do what's best for its people. Each city has to do what's best for its people. So we really need to, to be mindful of which community we're representing. But at the same time, we need to stop being part of the dam that's blocking other nations' progress. So when it comes to being sanctimonious about liberty and justice for all, we need to stop being part of the dam that's blocking other countries from having their freedom. We have to do better, and we can do better. And we can still be capitalist in our approach. We just need to buy local. 
We need to not buy something if we don't need it. We need to be mindful of what we buy and where we buy it. And we need to be mindful about the legacy of what we buy. Is it going to end up in the landfill? Is it going to, um, is it going to harm people down the line? If you need to buy something, check out secondhand stores. Finally, I want to leave you with an announcement about an event coming up this Saturday from 5 to 9 p.m. I plan on attending. It's called Say It Loud, a Black History Month celebration at the mill in downtown Ashland. Festivities will include live music and black history trivia. The event promises to be a quote, fun educational celebration for everyone. 10% of all sales will go to Ashland for Change, a community led organization geared toward educating others on social inequality and discrimination toward minority groups. And since I'm disabled, I am part of a minority group so I'm looking forward to meeting these people and getting to know them better. If you are still watching at this point, thank you so much for listening to my little extreme bit of wokeness. Uh, I don't consider myself a socialist or a liberal or a progressive or a Republican or a conservative or a libertarian. I just want a functioning society. And to do that, we have to study history, we have to learn from history, and we need to correct the mistakes that were made back then. Thanks so much for watching. I am your host, author Gwen Elise Clayton, and I upload videos every Tuesday to the Rivervine YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.